my clock says it's straight up noon. I'd like to welcome everybody to the I-29 Mu University Dairy webinar today. A uh, couple of things to start with. Uh, we've got kind of a nice group here uh, to make sure we don't have any background noise. If you will go ahead and mute yourself. Uh, during the program, if you want to type in a question uh, in chat, go ahead and do that. And we'll make sure uh, that we have, you know, time for that. Uh, depending upon how many uh, folks are left at the end, we may just open it up and let folks ask questions themselves. So today's program is how to bring skilled professionals to your dairy farm using the visa programs that are available. Uh, today, we welcome Dr. Rangel uh, as a presenter. Uh, he received his veterinary degree from the UNAM in Mexico, and he himself uh, is a recipient of the uh, TN visa, and he knows the process and in our industry. Uh, prior to having his own, uh, op prior to being the owner and operator of Optimum Dairy Consulting uh, since 2021, uh, he was our farm manager for the Iowa State Dairy. So I've known Miguel for some time. Um, welcome to the program. And as I always say uh, to the presenter, uh, Miguel. The podium is yours. Okay, thank you much for your for your introduction. And yes, I'm I'm happy to call you a friend after after some time that we spent at ISU Dairy. That was a, a very good experience. And um, well, thank you for inviting me. I know this is something that we talk about doing. And well, I'm glad that finally, well, we are here. Right, you made it possible. So yes. Uh, that's is that's the name of the presentation: How to bring skilled workers and professionals using visa programs. So I will start with the agenda. We will talk about, and I am sorry. I, sometimes I use my hands a lot. I will try not to, so I don't distract people. <laughs> but uh, we are going to talk about why use work visas, the most used visas for the dairy industry the visa requirements and other types of visas explained as, as well as the most fre frequent asked questions. So as usual with a presentation of this kind, I have a disclaimer that the information provided in this presentation is for general information only. It is not, and it is not intended to constitute legal advice. You always consult with websites on the different government agencies and obviously you can always consult with a, an immigration attorney so having said so now let's start with why use work visas work visas are more common these days that they use in the past especially especially in the ag industry so the visas you know we have to we have to understand something. We live in an, in an industrialized country that has access to higher education. So sometimes we don't have enough employees left for some entry level jobs or just in general, some jobs, you just don't have enough employees available. So the government issues visas to offset some labor shortages and to allow the hiring of skilled professionals in diverse fields. Now, an advantage of these visas is that, well, satisfied and happy employees are always going to provide stability and increase the profits of your operation. Um, another good feature is that employees are eager to come to the US. So they are eager to come legally and work. So that's a win-win. Now, just to summarize, these visas allow you to bring professionals, skilled workers. There are some restrictions that we will see in a little bit, but in general, you have that option, right? And that's why we are doing this seminar because I know there are many different kinds of visas and there are many questions. So in dairy industry is not different. I mean, you have visas for 
like I mentioned, different industries, the dairy industry is one that got benefited as well. So I'm gonna talk about some of the most common here. We have the H2A visa. This, this visa is an evolution of the Bracero program that is starting in 1942 during, during the Second World War. So you can imagine a lot of employees were, well, in the Second World War, and there were not enough employees in the country. So the government said, okay, let's bring temporary workers from Mexico, South America, Central America, the Philippines, and that's how you could get the harvest of different products in California, Georgia, uh, you know, Florida, etc. So these visas still are just for seasonal or temporary work. There is no de degree requ required, just skill and experience. And again, they can work on harvesting, planting, field work, all that is good. There is no yearly cap. So I was reading the other day, in 2021, we have 250,000 of those visas. And in 2007, we have only like 60,000 of those visas. So you can see there is a huge demand. Now, another visa that is pretty popular, and I guess years ago when I mentioned this, I remember talking about TN visas, especially when I was new in the country, and you mentioned a TN visa, and dairy producers were like, what is that? Well, now that's not the case because a lot of them are aware of these visas. But the, the TN visa is a visa that started with the North American Free Trade Agreement, a treaty in between Canada, Mexico, and the US, where they were trading products without paying tariff. So that was beneficial to all the parties involved. And one of those benefits was that the US could hire temporary, temporarily, professionals from Mexico or Canada, okay? So that's why you have this visa, the TN visa. Now, the validity is one to four years, and we need to see something here. This is for veterinarians, agronomists, breeding technicians, engineers, are more and more. So, but for us, that is key, because who doesn't need breathing technicians. Who doesn't need a veterinarian in the calf barn or a veterinarian taking care of sick cows or fresh cows, etc.? So that is key. Now, there is no yearly cap, which means you don't have a limitation as far as how many TN visas you can bring or the government doesn't have a limitation. They can issue as many as they are needed. So now let me talk a little bit about how to go about getting a visa, because I think this is this is important and sometimes overlooked. Um, in some cases, by not doing the due diligence, sometimes you don't get the benefits of the program. But for example, you wanna hire someone. So first, you need to see it from the farm perspective. You, it needs to be a strategic decision. You need to make sure that you are bringing someone that is actually going to match the needs of your farm. Like you are going to, you have issues with breeding. Well, you're going to bring someone that does that, that has experience breeding. You don't wanna bring someone that is going to learn unless you have a very good network of veterinarians or technicians in your place that can teach him. But if you don't, and you need someone that brings you performance or solutions, then you need to bring someone with that experience. Now, this is the next, the next goal is to have that, the performance goal. Yes, like I mentioned, it needs to bring solutions to your challenges and it needs to work in synergy with your team. With that, I mean, the good teamwork that we all talk about, it's always good to have that relationship in between the employee the team, the team, and obviously the, the owner or the manager. And then from, I call this the HR perspective because it's almost like a human resources perspective where this is a new process that involves many steps. So all those steps need to be in a coordinated manner. From the time you hire, you choose a candidate to fill out the paperwork, 
schedule the interview, get the candidate into the US. So there are many things that need to happen. So that's why it is important to keep those in mind. And like I always say, talk to your professional, talk to your immigration attorney, talk to your, in this case, your consultant or your recruiter. Now, once the employee is in the US, we still have more, more, more things to pay attention to. For example, you have an employee already in the US, we need to make sure we comply with local and federal laws. That employee needs to fill out his I-9, W-4, he needs to get a social security number, driver's license, health insurance, and well, as far as the farm goes, he needs to be brief. We call this the onboarding on what are the expectations of my farm? What things you can do and you cannot, this is how my farm works, et cetera. So those are things that sometimes get for forgotten. So now for a TN visa, I'm gonna talk about some of the requirements. Pretty much the government wants to know that you are a legitimate company. and They wanna know the size of your operation, how many employees you have, et cetera. So that's what they wanna know. And as far as the applicant goes, they wanna know that the applicant has the requirements to apply for one of those visas. So if they meet the criteria, they can apply for one of those visas. And I guess I mentioned this sometimes more than once, but it's very important to remember that TN visas are only for Canadian and Mexican. So people that they were born in Ecuador and they went to school in Mexico, even though they got their degree in Mexico, they can't apply for this visa unless they are Mexican citizens. So that's one thing to, to keep in mind. Now, the next, oh, I think my presentation froze in here. Okay, here it is. So the application pr process is just like any government application process. A lot, a lot of forms, in this case, the most common is the DS-160 where that's for the applicant, where he needs to fill that form, pay fees, schedule an appointment. I think most of the people are familiar with that process. And obviously once they get to the point where they have an appointment, they need to get the support letter, a valid passport, the education certification, pretty much everything that qualifies that employee to be working at your place. So that is, that is key. If you got to this point, it's because all the steps previously were done properly. So now that you are at this stage, it is very important to make sure that this employees successfully get through that interview. So, you, once they get approved, they will get the visa in between 10 to 15 days. This could be, uh, depending on the time of the year, three to six months, three to six month process. It all depends on the time of the year. Um, once they get approved, the visa can be gotten in 10 to 15 days. So now, now this is, I'm going to talk about the other visa that is used a lot in the dairy industry, which is the H2A, H2A visa. This visa, again, this is only for seasonal jobs or temporary jobs. For example, they come nine months or 10, and then they go back to their country. It could be people from Mexico, it could be from Honduras, it could be from um, other countries, Central America, it doesn't have to be Mexico. So now if someone wishes to hire people with H2A visa, well, they need to prove that that job is temporary or seasonal. They need to demonstrate that there are no employees in the US that can perform that job. And then they need to demonstrate that hiring H2A employees will not affect the wages of US employees in that particular job. So in order to do so, well, the government has some, some steps in place. So this is, uh, this is one of those application processes where you need to send an application to 
the U.S. Department of Labor, okay? So you need to certify that your job is just temporary. Then you need to submit the form I-129 to uses and pay the fees. And well, then you need to meet the Department of Labor requirements. That means with this visa, you are pretty much in charge of the employees as far as, are you going to provide lodging? If yes, you need to provide a, a suitable place for them to live. If not, then you need to state so. Are you going to provide meals, three meals a day? If not, then you need to provide utensils for these people to cook. Are you going to provide transportation? Is the transport is transportation on you or on them? Are they going to be able to go to the job site? So those are kind of things that you need to pass an inspection. And if you pass and everything is good, well, then you get your 129 approved and then employees outside of the US can apply for a visa. So for the employee, well, it's a little different as far as they still need to file the DS-160 online, pay the fee, the schedule an appointment, show up at the appointment with the DS-160 receipt, the forms that you will send because you were approved. They need obviously a passport, a picture if they don't have one. And the documents that show the strong bonds to their home country, for example, a property deed, maybe they have a business so they can bring uh, something that shows that they, are, they own a business in their home country or a job letter. Maybe they have a job and they are coming back every year. So they need to show that. Well, and once approved, well, they are good to go. So now I talked a lot about those visas, but there are more, like I mentioned earlier. Now, and some of the visas that I receive a lot of questions or there are confusions are, for example, the H-1 visa. The H-1 visa is a visa that is offered worldwide. That means, that if you live in Guatemala and you wanna to come to work in, to the US and let's say you are a veterinarian, well, you could apply for an H-1B. Why? Because you are not Mexican, so you can't apply for a TN visa, let's say. So this H-1B is worldwide. So there is a waiting list because of that. So times vary, okay? So sometimes the H-1B, or many times, I wouldn't say that sometimes, they require a specialty occupation, right? You can just have your bachelor's degree and that's fine, but sometimes they require a master's or a PhD. So it all depends on, on, on the industry, right? So for us, maybe you have an embryo transfer business and you need someone with a higher education degree. Well, you can ask for uh, some, someone with a master's or a PhD or, or any kind of higher education degree that you require for, for them, and you can ask for an H-1 visa. Now, this is a dual in, intent, which means they come not only temporary, but they could apply for permanent residency. So that's the thing with those visas so which is it is it is good in the sense that if you really like that employee or that employee is a crucial or fundamental part of your operation then it is on your best interest to keep him so an h1 visa is a good option now what about the j1 the j1 is mostly for well it takes two to five months to process is mostly for trainees or interns they are here doing just training, just rotating on all the different areas of the farm. They are learning the business. That visa is offered worldwide. So yeah, you can bring a trainee from almost any part of the world. Um, that one requires a sponsor. The sponsor is going to be a, an independent organization that is going to have a plan and they will be responsible for those trainees. For example, you wanna have them working in your farm. Well, they will be supervised and they will be rotating areas. They will work in the office for 
some time doing managerial duties. They will be doing financial duties. They will be learning ad pretty much administrative duties. Then they can go to work, let's say the health, the, her health. They will be just rotating with someone, learning how they take care of fresh cows, how they, how, what they do with mastitis cows, things related to health and obviously nutrition. So they will train with the, maybe they talk to the nutritionist or the nutritionist is at the farm and he's taking them to see the different things they do with, with the feed. So those are the kind of things that they will do. So anyway, that's a non-immigrant visa. So, which means once the visa is expired, well, they need to apply for a different visa if, if they wanna come back. So before I, I go to the EB3, another thing with the TN visa, like I mentioned, four, four to six months to process, Canada and Mexico only. There is a list of professions. It's called the NAFTA professionals list. So you can see all the different ones, but I almost mentioned the ones that pertain to the dairy industry. And very important, this is a non-immigrant visa. So again, you need to keep in mind, this is not for coming and staying in the US. So this is for a, a time. They usually give you one to four years. Now the EV3, because I know people ask me a lot about, about that one. Well, that pretty much is the green card application. So you pretty much want to come and be a permanent, permanent resident. So because of that, that is a long process. It can take 15 to 42 months because it depends, each case is different. So the other restriction is that, well, this visa is offered worldwide. So depending on the country where you are applying from, you need to see what are the chances. And first you need to have a sponsor, in this case, a company, a dairy uh, that is willing to sponsor you so you come to the US. If you are already in the US, because it depends if you are already here, maybe you could apply for the EV3 if your employer is pretty happy with you and he wouldn't like to lose you. Well, they say, you know what? I think you are doing really well and I'm interested in sponsoring you so you can have a permanent residency and that way you are part of my team. So that's a that's how a lot of times it goes. Now, the applicant doesn't need to be in the US. It, he could be or she could be in another country, but obviously the process is it, going to take longer. So you, if you can wait three years and a half, well, then you can do it. But obviously that's, that's if someone wants to really hire you because you, have a, you add value to that farm it could be a long process. So now the general considerations. So we saw some of the visas. In order to get a visa, it is really important to see, well, where are you located? What is your profession or not? Or if you are a skilled worker. So that way we know what kind of visa is a better suit for you. And then not all visas are equal, are created equal. Um, sometimes you apply for one type of visa and later on life changes and then you can move to the next or a, just a different kind of visa. That's kind of what I was talking with the, recently with the EV3s, for example. So let's say you came here and with a TN visa and after five, six years, you became assistant manager. So now you're now your employer is pretty happy with your performance and he's thinking, well, I would really like him to stay. So obviously each case is different. So it all depends on your specific background, but if possible, you can be moved to an, to an EV3. So it all depends. That's, that said, that's why you need to consult because there are many ways to get to one of those visas. And the other thing that I, I wanted to, to mention is, well, just like the TN, it's someone is from Peru. He's not going to be able to get a TN. That's from the get-go, no matter if they got their education in Mexico or Canada. So 
this is what I call the optimum roadmap because after, well, with what I've seen in the field and after kind of talking and experiencing different, different situations, there are some things that are just, you know, pretty evident in the industry. And sometimes there are not enough steps or the process, like I said, it to be cumbersome. So we need to take steps in order to get what we need at the farm, not just get any employee. So this is kind of like the, I would call it like best practice, but obviously each, each recruiter have a different way to do it. But the first thing is to discuss with your team the intention of hiring a foreign professional. That shouldn't be a surprise for anyone. If you're going to bring someone, the herdsman, the, the guy that, throw, that drops feed, or even the veterinarian, or especially him, they need to know that there is going to be a new professional. If it is a prof professional, if it is an H2A visa, well, they may not be working in the farm itself. They may have to be doing anything else, but that's the thing that you need to define first. That Then, if everybody's on board, then you talk to your recruiter about the plans, the requirements, and set a time frame. Why? Because like I mentioned before, it could take months. So if you need some somebody in, in June, and you tell me now, well, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> so the other aspect to consider is once you have a candidate, well, it's time to file forms, questionnaires, submit applications, et cetera. And once you have all that, well, all the information is in the system. So you are already, you are already working on that. So that is good because in the meantime, you can communicate with your candidate or applicant, um, talk to him, prepare him. Hey, this is what's going on. This is where you may be coming to the US. Just be prepared for your interview, et cetera. And then, when the interview is closed, well, you send the final documents required for the interview. And this is another thing that I, I tell my, my clients. That's why I am close to my applicants because some of them have never done this. So going to the embassy or consulate, that's a very solemn en environment. So it's pretty quiet, pretty strict. So a lot of this, the, these applicants, they get intimidated. But the thing is, no, they have everything they need. So that's the environment that it's in there. It's fine. That's the way it should be. But they need to be prepared because a lot of them get nervous. A lot of them, even though they have all the documentation that they need, they just get intimidated. So anyway, once the, the visa is approved, well, then we need to provide a plan okay, where is he going to stay? When is he going to start? Because now we know. So now we have a better idea. I'm just going to share, for example, I always tell my, my, my clients to make time or someone at the dairy need, needs to make some time so they can go get the employee, give him a tour, introduce him to the team, introduce him to the farm, his coworkers, et cetera. I, that goes a long way into easing that transition. Sometimes this is the first time they come to the US, they come to a different state, different weather, different environment, a new job with new coworkers. So it's a lot. So it is always good to ease into that transition. And I remember when, when I got my, my TN visa the first time that Kelly Cunningham, he is the manager at Milk Unlimited, and he went to the airport. And I remember he went to the airport. He picked me up. I was extremely nervous. Didn't know what to expect. But he was, you know, hey, Miguel. He went to meet me. He was extremely friendly. And then we went to it. I even remember it was Applebee's. And I remember I even ate a chicken parmesan. <laughs> so those are things that really stay with you. So I was like, how is that this manager that is really busy carve some time out of his busy day to go meet me, you know? And I think that goes a long way as opposed to just scrambling to get someone from the airport just as an afterthought or someone showing to the farm, oh, here is the new vet. 
oh yeah, go um, talk to Carlos and he will take care of you. Sometimes that's just not the best way to onboard an employee. So now going, going on with the rest, once the employee is here, this is kind of part of the same, the onboarding. Remember, he needs to fill out the W-4, the I-9, get the social security number, driver's license, bank account. So we need to facilitate those things so he is up to date with the local and federal laws. He's going to be driving. He will need to get a driver's license as soon as possible. If he's going to be, if he's going to be getting a health insurance, well, definitely he needs to do so. And just an example, I remember an employee that was surprised because he went to the hospital and they charged him $300. And he was like, but why if I have a uh, health insurance? And no, he had workers comp, not health insurance, but he didn't know. So these are things that new employees don't know. And I always tell my clients, just offer the insurance. This is what we have. This is what we offer or we don't offer. If they decline, they just need to know that that's on them. But if they accept, well, that way they know that they are covered, especially if there is an accident. That was a cheap $300. It could be, a, I don't know, anything else, a car crash, something else where the employees don't, don't have insurance and then they are paying thousands of dollars. So, okay, now moving on to the next one. Just a review. Managing a farm, as you know, I guess, whoever is in, in this industry, the ag industry, and especially dairy, that's a 365 uh, day and night job 24 seven. So it's, it's, it's pretty demanding. So hiring someone new for your farm is not something that you do every day. So there is a lot that, a lot of unknowns, a lot of forms, deadlines, et cetera. So that's why I always tell you, talk to your recruiter, recruiter talk to your attorney, so everything is done in a timely manner. And now, you know, if it is done right, an employee can greatly change the face of your operation, at least in those areas where, where those employees are operating. So that is always good to, to know that they can boost your performance. Another thing is, well, the decisions, once you have people that you can trust, you know that the decisions can be made with less risk. And you can delegate with confidence. You can say, you know what, I'm going to go to Cancun for two weeks in January. And you know, you have the team at home that they can take care of your farm. They can take care of their areas because they know what they are doing. And I just remember another case where this was a, a calf barn where definitely they were having issues, but by bringing the right professional, you can tell how things were changing. Mortality decreased, the management pretty much overall, because this person, it was a veterinarian. It was doing all those changes that sometimes your, your veterinarian, they don't have time to stay, stay there the whole day because they have more clients. So they have protocols, but sometimes the employees don't know how to follow those protocols, but you have someone with experience and then can help you navigate those waters. So it's like the you heard veterinarian delegating to this veterinarian that is going to be working at your farm. So that's how this should work, right? Like I said, this is a teamwork. That's how it goes. And then, well, the positive work environment, this is something that a lot of times is, is forgotten too, but I, I mentioned it because there are cases where they bring a professional, an agronomist or a breeding technician, and that person is four or five months and then they leave. They bring another one, they do the investment and they bring another one, another four or five months and that person leaves and then they bring another one. And that's when you start wondering what's really going on in this place because that's not normal. So if someone is leaving their home country to come here, that's a pretty big deal. So if they are not staying, even though they have this work opportunity, something else is going on. And that's when, well, when you can just go and 
find out what's really going on with the culture of my place, why these guys are not lasting. Um, well, you will find out what's going on. It could be a culture, the culture of the place, or you just have employees that are disruptive and those are the ones that need, need to go. Uh, so anyway, something to consider, especially because it happens more than, more than what you think. So now I have a few questions here. Usually people ask me for, for some questions and is, are these visas for milk harvesting technicians? In other words, milkers. Sadly, no. No, I wish, but no, because milking cows is a year round endeavor. So you can have people with temporary visas in here because that takes the whole year. So no, you can't, sadly, you can't do that. Another question they asked me, uh, it's what task can H2A visa workers perform? For example, if it is a dairy farm, you can always have them help you putting up silage. Maybe they can help you spread manure. They can help you maybe during summer, you are power washing hutches. Well, maybe they can help you. Actually, that's something that they can do. They can power wash hutches. So you don't power wash hutches in winter. So, and after that, well, they can do dirt work or field work, I would say. So there are always things that they can do. And that doesn't require them to be there the whole year. The, the whole year. Now, sometimes when people get a visa, they ask me, can I bring my family? Well, yes, they can. Obviously, that takes, takes a little longer, but there it's possible. But I always recommend if you are coming, come yourself first. Meanwhile, you establish, and then for sure, you can bring your family, right? Another question that I received, can I work in another farm with my TN visa? Yes, you can, but you need to file some paperwork before you do, like the I-129, the employer change, because you can't just go from farm to farm with your TN visa, because you still need to, you need, you need to communicate and disclose that you are moving to another farm. So immigration knows that you are not working in farm A and now you are working in farm, a, farm B. And there is more about that, but the quick answer is that's what you need to do. If you don't do that, then you would be forfe forfeiting your, your visa, you would be doing illegally. So there are many immigration reform efforts. There are one that actually talks about having visas for, for, for milkers. So that is something that I will leave the, the links and you can look into it. Definitely, we know, like I mentioned before, this is the ag industry. Well, in general, we always have, we are in a lack. We have a, like a 5 million employee shortage. So we need employees and the ag industry, it's, well, it's, it's affected. So these are the, the links. You can see different forms. These are the different government agencies and the National Milk Producer Federation. They know about these issues. So there is definitely, we know we have the need of employees and there is definitely a way to do it. It is just that, well, for political reasons, et cetera, that they, they go beyond the scope of this presentation. I'm not gonna talk about that in here, but definitely there are there are things that, that can be done. And well, you as a producer, uh, you have a, an interest in this because definitely I know how difficult it is to find find employees. So that's all I have so far. Um, thank you much for everybody, and thank you for thank you, Fred, for allowing me to be here. That I have my information down there, and now. I will entertain any questions that you may guys have. Thank Very you. good. Very good. Uh, we're going to start right off with one of the first questions. So we talked about temporary visas quite a bit and they don't fit melters. So what type of visa can be used to hire melters? Well, let's say that, huh. That's a tricky one because you per se, let's say you want to bring a milker under an EV3 visa. So pretty much you are sponsoring him to be a permanent resident. So let's say you do that. 
and it takes four years. So finally, after four years, because you you knew or you demonstrated you you demonstrated that there are no milkers, so you can hire people. So okay, you go through the lengths of doing a an EV3. The once that person is here and they have a green card, well, that's the tricky part because you can't force him to stay at your place. So if in your place they are making, I don't know, like 12, 15 dollars an hour, but they can do more money doing something else in a different industry, they are free to go and do that. So that's that's the caveat. So technically that's how you could do something like that. But in reality, it doesn't have a practical application. So that's that's why it's difficult. Besides, it's expensive and it's a very long process. Okay. Um, for onboarding, what type of resources are most helpful for individuals transitioning to living in the US? Uh, the question is thinking, healthcare, food assistance, that kind of things. I think for them, and at, at least that's, that's, that's what I do, <laughs> but I always give them a list of what things they will need. So that way when they come, hey, these are the first things you need to get, don't forget about it. And the websites, I guess this time it's in this 2023, you can use Google and find where the office is, the Social Security Administration office is, et cetera. So those are the kind of the main things, how to open a bank account, what are the banks in town. So as long as they have their passport, as long as they have an ID, that's why it's important to get a driver's license. So once they are getting all those documents, when they open a bank account, they only need the, the passport and where they live, like the address a document from the dairy that they are paying paying them. So yeah, those are the things that I would say on the administrative side of things, that would they, that's what they will need. Okay. The question is, what does monitoring of visa workers and enforcement of visa rules look like? I'm assuming, is there an inspection service or what, what does it look like? That's something that it happens, but it is not something that happens constantly. But definitely if, <laughs> let's say there is a farm with a lot of TN visas, and at some point there is a complaint, well, that's when you have the authorities to go and just check on what's going on at that, at that place. Or if there is, there is some sort of complaint, but there is, there, there is really nothing that is going to say they are checking the farms every year or every six months. That, that is not how it works. So, and it's whenever they, they think, and they always, obviously they have their own, their own um, guidelines, but definitely sometimes you don't see them in years at a farm. We had uh, the chief investigator for uh, Homeland do a program several months ago, and he says, I'm one guy, I cover about 40 counties, I don't show up unless there's a complaint. So that, that was his statement. Um, yeah. Is it easier to get potential employees from Puerto Rico, and how do you go about that? For Puerto Rico, well, that's a, that's a territory of the U.S. I really never done anything with Puerto Rico. So that's a good question. And to be honest with Puerto Rico, I don't know, because I, I has never been a nation of art has ever asked me to come because it's a U.S. territory. So <laughs> that one is never done one of those. That's a good question for uh, an immigration attorney. Okay, the question is, if you already know the person you want to come and work, does that ease some of the waiting? No. Shorten? Does it? 
No, no, still they have to do the same paperwork and submit applications, et cetera. The only thing is that at least you don't have to look for the candidate. So I guess on that regard, uh, do you will save a few days, but the rest is the same. Very good. Okay, you've got the interview process. Uh, you're sitting there at the kitchen table and you realize this isn't going to be a good fit. How much obligation do you have? Do you still have to hire the person or what? it costs the what obligation does the dairy have if they just don't want to hire the person okay by the point he already got his visa approved you already paid you may still have to pay i suppose the to your recruiter but as far as the fee since the visa was already approved the applicant may have already paid for the visa but if you decide by then that you don't want him then you just have to notify him that you know what uh, this is not gonna work and that's it you don't have you are not obligated to bring him or he's not obligated either to to work with you so by then i guess you lost your whatever amount you pay for the recruiting etc and obviously the government fees but you don't have to bring him the applicant will be out the money that he paid for the appointment for the visa um pretty much if he got a plane ticket but if not well at least he didn't lose that but there is no obligation there is not a contract so you don't have to you are not obligating to obligated to have him here when you go through these visas, you, you've talked about fees and different things. Is there a mandatory salary or wage or is that set in each locale with each farm and employee? Usually the salary is stipulated by the employer. So in the step two, I always ask my clients so if you think this employee is worth, I'm just going to say a, a, just a number, $50,000. So that's what you will offer. Okay, so that's okay. That's what you think his, his work is worth. And then we communicate with them. But definitely, if the salary is really low, well, some of them will say, no, thanks. I, I, I'm going to pass because there are some other, some other dairies or industries businesses hiring people so they will pass on that one and maybe the other one is offering sixty thousand, and they say you know what for sixty thousand, yes i would go so yes at the end of the day they need to set the salary and that's the amount that they consider is fair okay we have a, a listener who says i'm new to the whole process how does our farm go about finding a Recruiter and his follow-up is, is that what you do? Yes, that's what I do. Yeah, that's exactly what I do. Plus the and, consulting. <laughs> and, you know, if you look in the back of hordes and different places, you can find recruiters. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. Miguel is the one who's here today, but they're, they're available. One of the things that you mentioned in your listing is it requires a visit to the consult consulate. Where's the nearest consulate if you're along the I-29 corridor? Okay. That my the okay. In Mexico, we have the US Embassy, which is in Mexico City because embassies can only be in the capital city of the country. Then yeah. around the country, you have consulates. So when I mentioned that the applicants need to go to the consulates, they need to go to the consulates or the embassy in Mexico City, where they actually can issue TN visas. Those are uh, Ciudad Juarez, Guadalajara, and Mexico City, the embassy. 
So that's where you can get a TN visa because not all consulates process TN visas. And that's something that, that's a question, actually a good question because sometimes they are like, okay, I'm, I live here by, let's say uh, Cancun. So I'm going to go a consulate here. I said, no, because those consulates don't process TN visas. You need to go to Guadalajara or Mexico City. And they didn't know that, for example. So no, when I, when the applicant needs to go to a consulate, but he needs to be here in, I'm not here. It needs to be in Mexico. So once they're here, there's no annual requirement that they go to a consulate and, and do something. No. No, okay, very good. Um, I'm looking through the list to see what else we have. Uh, okay, I think everything in the chat box we've got. You'd mentioned about retention. If you have employees who stay a short time and move on, give me a couple of troubleshooting things that a dairyman needs to really ask themselves. What, what are the things that causes people to move on? I think one of the, I always consider that one of the main drivers of poor performance is the human factor. And sometimes you have people that is well prepared, but they just can't get along. Or you have people in charge that sometimes it's just a clash, personalities clash. Um, well, when you have that kind of environment, it's gonna be difficult. The other thing is sometimes we need to, okay, you are gonna bring someone to your farm because you have issues. We need to be open to new ideas. We know we don't know everything, right? It's like, if I wanna talk about mastitis with Leo teams, well, Leo is gonna say, well, that's my area. And I accept that. So I actually, I learned from him. So that's the same in here. If, if you bring someone that he knows a lot about calf health and you have a person in that area, but your mortality is, is high, and you haven't been able to solve the issue, then you bring someone with experience and it's one of those conversations where, hey, this is a problem that we have. And I went through the process of hiring this professional because I know he can help me with this issue, but re we really need to work together. So that's when you pretty much lay the law and you start working. Obviously, like I said, there are employees who may, may need to adapt and if you're in, you have one that really is not listening or is not willing to work, well, then that's you, you may have to do something different there. But yes, that's something that happens a lot, especially because there are, there are employees with a lot of experience and sometimes it's difficult for them to just change because someone came from Mexico and whether they have a degree or not, and they, they say that they know better. I think that's when we need to manage those egos and say, okay, wait a minute. We need to be open. If something is not giving us the results that we want, we need to do something. And this is what I would like to try. And I'm, I want my farm to perform. So let's give it a try, so. Okay, now we've got a reality question. Is it necessary okay. to hire an attorney to facilitate this process? Or is this something a dairyman can do themselves? Well, if it is necessary, the, I guess that's, it says to facilitate. Well, to facilitate, yes. Definitely you can do it. But like I said, this, there are a lot of time frames. There is a lot of things that you need to know where to send the forms, when to send the letters, how to, there is a lot of how to's. And even from the moment you have a candidate. If you have a candidate in Mexico, sometimes they don't know. Like I said, they, they are telling me, I'm going to go to the consulate here in, in Campeche. And you are like, you are not going to get a visa there. You need to go to Mexico City or Guadalajara. And they are like surprised. And as soon as they start answering questions in the questionnaire, they just keep 
calling you. Hey, what do I put in here? What do I put in there? They are asking me this. What do I answer? So it's a lot that goes into it. That's why I always recommend have the services of a professional that knows how this is done because there are a lot of unknowns. And if you don't do it right or you miss the deadlines, which has happened where you have a candidate that goes to get a visa, he never received the, the, the package or the employer letter, the support letter. And the consul is like, well, you have nothing. So I'm sorry, I can't give you a visa. So, you know, there are things of that sort that if you go through the lengths to hire someone, what you pay is an investment because the benefits are going, going to surpass whatever you pay to hire the right person. Very good. Um, we're gonna ask one last question, but uh, for the listeners, uh, go ahead and type a question in if you have a, a, a last question. Otherwise, I'm gonna do a little review here with you, Miguel. The H-2A visas are temporary. The TN visa is long-term. How long is long-term? Well, you can get it for, let's say four years, but you can renew it. You renew the I-94, which is like the, regist um, the record of your, you entering to the US. So you can renew that and you will be fine. Yes, you will need to renew your visa too, but that's something that you can just renew perpetually. It is not something that you only can apply for two or three visas on your lifetime. No, you can keep doing it. As long as the NAFTA agreement is still standing, you have TN visas. If we don't have that agreement, that agreement is gone, so the visas. Okay, I'm not seeing any additional questions. Well, yep, one popped in. Uh, do some farms make their TN workers pay back the farms for fees uh, occurred to them, uh, bringing them there? Is that the standard practice? Well, it. I know some do, but. I know it's it's a, it's a complicated because sometimes the producer is like, well, I already pay all this for for this candidate, but usually the, the employer is the one that is interested in having labor in their farms. So what I understand, sometimes they come and if they don't last, but that's why I say, if you have an employee that is is happy, he doesn't have a reason to leave. Now, yes, you can charge, but that's something that you need to disclose beforehand. And that's when the candidate could decline your offer. Say, you, you know what? Thank you, but I don't. I don't think I should pay for my visa because sometimes they don't even last that long if the conditions are not the right conditions to work. So that's a tricky question because of the conditions. So, and if you do, you can charge, and they don't pay and they leave. I mean, you can sue, but I don't think you will have many chances of pursuing or actually doing that. I don't know if you could get your money back. Okay, that's the last question in the chat box. Miguel, a lot of great information. We've got your contact information uh, there on the screen if people have additional questions. At this point, we'd like to thank everybody for attending today. And uh, I have in the chat box the uh, archive information there at the i29mu.com under webinars. And then we'd ask that you please evaluate this webinar uh, there uh, uh, in the, the chat box. In addition, uh, once the program's been archived, you will uh, receive an email from me that has that archive uh, information as well as the Qualtrics survey, and we ask you to fill it out. Again, Miguel, thank you very much. Thank people for listening. With that, we will end the program.